Okay, so now we're going to go through and use the projectile motion video that I had you guys collect earlier this week. I'm going to show you exactly how to work with that. However, um, I'm also going to show you in case you didn't get a video that you wanted to use and you'd rather use mine, that works just fine. I'm going to have something to supplement that. So here on Edmodo, we're going to go over to Folders. We're going to go down to Lab Materials. And then this one here, uh, 2015, September 24th, and then this other thing is actually a timestamp. I took this at 9.06 in the morning, it would seem. This is the video that I want. It's a high-speed video, and it's going to give us a lot of data points. So if you right-click on this and do Save Link As, okay, brings this up. I'm going to go to, for me, I'm going to put this somewhere where I can find it. I'm going to go to the desktop and I'm going to go with Lab 6, because that's actually what we're working on right now. Uh, I can keep it the same file name, I can change it to something else, um, but we'll just keep it like this for the time being. It's going to download that. So I've got this from Edmodo. Now I'm going to come over and I'm going to bring up Tracker. I'm going to do File, Import, so we can bring in our video. And I'm in a different folder, this is Projectile. What I actually need is, where did it go? I'm blind, lab six, and here's my video. So I'm gonna bring this in. Now this one's relatively, it's both short and long because I had some help on this one so I don't have a bunch of extra stuff on the sides. Let's see what this one looks like. Now it's going through pretty quickly here but you can see that I have the meter stick here and then there's someone over on the side getting ready to, there we go, throwing the ball in projectile motion. It is flying through the air. We tried to keep it pretty close to the wall there without actually hitting the wall, so we should be close enough on that. All right, now once again, I need to trim down the extra space that I do not want. So I'm gonna scale this back. Let's go to maybe there. 180, 181 is where we'll cut it off. Let's go all the way back to, oops, that's a little too far. Well, that looks like it's left their hand. Let's go ahead and call it 90 to maybe 180. That sounds good. So I'm going to start it at frame 90 and end at frame 180. And you'll notice the frame rate is 120 frames per second. Now we've got something that's just flying through the air. It happens really quick, actually. I mean, imagine just tossing a ball. And we've got 90 frames, 90 different pieces of data that we can collect with this. Now there are a couple ways to deal with this. You can also go in clip settings. You can change step size where it will only look at, say if I put three in there, it will only look at every third frame. In other words, I'm still getting it in a bunch of different places, but it cuts down on the number of frames that I have to actually click on. However, that kind of, I'm not going to say it defeats the purpose of having it in high speed because high speed keeps the object from blurring like we saw with the puck. But nonetheless, I'd rather try and keep all the information if I can. And again, I don't want to click 90 times, so we'll see if we can come up with something. I'm going to go to Calibration, Calibration Stick, and teach it the size of a meter. Let's do that. I can actually wheel up on the mouse and zoom in some if I want to try and get this extra correct. Oops. Scroll over. That one looks pretty good. This isn't required, but so you know, it's something that you can actually do. I can zoom way out as well. And that's with the mouse wheel. Zoom in, zoom out. Okay. Now I've taught it one meter. I'm going to hide that. Remember, it's still there, but I'm just hiding it. And now I'm going to bring up my axis. Mm, let's just put this more or less at the beginning. And here's a case where now that it's moving in two dimensions, I can't use my trick of just fast forwarding and seeing where it is later and try and get everything in one dimension. In this case, our goal should be to try and get our stuff set up where we have the classic X and Y system. Now mine could be a little off if I wasn't holding my camera exactly level, but we'll see how much that, that comes into play here and how bad the video might be. So I'm just gonna put my origin where the object started. Now I'm gonna hide it. It's still there, but hiding it. I'm going to do create point mass. And just like we did before, I have a regular cursor and hold down shift and it becomes a square cursor, but don't click yet. I want you to hold down control as well. 
While you're holding down Control and Shift, you end up with a crosshair with a circle around it. This is why we've been using the orange ball. I want you to then click on, let's go with the center of the orange ball. This brings up an auto track box. You can let go of Control and Shift now. And it's basically saying this template here is a whole bunch of orange pixels. And when I click search, it's going to go from frame 90 to frame 91, and it's going to search for this cluster of orange pixels. As long as you don't have orange pixels that show up anywhere else in the image, it should hopefully be able to lock onto the ball, and it will find it in each of the following frames, and then move to the next one and do the same thing over and over again. In other words, it's doing the search and click for us which is great because otherwise I'd have to do it 90 times. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to click search and it's going to go through pretty quickly, but I can watch to make certain nothing crazy happens. Here we go. Now it's following it, it's following it pretty well actually, seems to be able to differentiate it. And this is where it can be very helpful to make certain that wherever you're filming, the background or anything else that you see does not match the object that you want to try and track because that way it keeps it from getting confused and trying to follow somewhere else. Now it's not perfect, I see the, uh, the little clicker actually wobble around some on the ball itself, but it is following the ball, which is good. In this case, it did not give me any errors saying, oh, I couldn't find a great match. If it does that, it'll usually give you an option that says accept match. Um, you can always stop it partway through if need be, and then start manually selecting it if it starts losing the object. But uh, the way we've set this up, hopefully you will not have that problem. Once you're done, you can click close. And here we go. Here's the first of the data that I actually want us to have. In fact, it came up by default. The position in the X, my horizontal position, versus time. You'll notice that this graph is a nice straight line. That says something about our motion in the X direction. I want you to think about that and see what conclusion you can draw. The other thing that we're going to look for is our motion in the y direction. Here's my position versus time for the vertical axis, my y direction. We have a curved line, a line that is actually curving downward. That also tells us something. Notice how y is very different than the x. I can change these again by clicking on x, whatever my vertical axis is, and choose whatever I'd like. So let's go back to the Y position, for instance. In fact, we've been playing around with the position versus time. There's one other thing that we have not talked about as much in class. It's called the trajectory, and that's actually keeping track of uh, where the object is. So we'd have a position in the Y, and we'd have a position in the X. Well, I can make that show up here by, I've got Y, X. This is my trajectory we can see that nice parabolic shape that we've talked about before. In fact, it looks very similar to the position versus time, but you'll notice that when I change these, the graph actually does change. Partly because it goes to 0 0.5, 1, 1 1.5, 2.0, oh, my units change quite a bit. Okay, but the main things that we're after right now are the time, the x position, and the y position. So what I'm going to do is, you'll notice that there are a whole bunch of these because, again, we had 90 frames. So I'm going to left click on the top left. I'm going to go down to the bottom right. I'm going to copy selected cells. We'll do full precision. That sounds fine. And then I'm going to bring up Excel like we've done before. I'm going to paste that in with Control V, or you can right click and hit paste. You'll notice that we've got a whole bunch of data now, 90 points. Okay, we're going to do the same thing that we did before. We're going to do insert a graph or chart. I'm going to do a scatter chart. And I don't know if it's brought up exactly what I want. I hate it when Excel does this, but that's okay. What I'm going to do is I'm going to left click on the data. It looks like it did do both of the graphs, but it put them in one. So let's, let's change that. I'm going to do select data. This is the one where it has my X position. Here's the Y. I'm going to delete the one for the Y. Let's see what that does. Okay, there we go. Uh, my numbers are looking a little weird. Let's see if we can do the same thing that we did in the past. I'm gonna left click up here in the left corner next to the A and above the one, and that selects all my cells. I'm gonna right click. I'm gonna go down to format cells. I'm gonna go to number. Let's go number maybe three decimal places just to be safe. Looks pretty good. 
although my graph could be prettier. Let's go down to maybe two decimal places, or one for that matter. Format cells, number, let's try one, see what happens. That looks pretty good for my graph. Now, when I actually look at my data over here, you'll see a lot of it looks very similar. Though when I click on it, instead of 1.1, it actually still tells me that it's 1.0706. So when I do that, I'm not actually changing any of my data. I'm just making it where it looks a little bit prettier. Okay. Um, for this one, I'm going to click up here and let's give it a better name. Horizontal position versus time. So this is my XVT graph. I'm going to scoot that over. You can always put your name in there as well. I'm going to right click here. We're going to go to add trend line. And this time in particular, we want to make certain that we're paying close attention. So there's linear. What if I did polynomial? Logarithmic, can't find that. Let's see. I'm having trouble actually seeing the trend line. Although on this one, a trend line, we should end up with a linear trend line. I don't know why it isn't showing clearly on here, but most likely in whatever version you're using, you'll be able to see, let's see. Solid line, transparency, let's go with a higher width. Am I seeing it then? No. There might be something wrong with my video adapter, but that's okay. So we've got linear. Oh, it's also got it in blue. That's strange. There, black. Interesting. It helps if you can actually see the line, see how well it fits. So for instance, here's the polynomial. That one's not bad, actually. Um, moving average, not bad. A lot of these are pretty decent ones. Although when you do the polynomial one, if I put the equation on, on there, which is what we want to do, display equation, you'll notice that the value times the x squared, in other words, times the time squared, is going to be a really small number. It's going to be almost zero, and that's how this ends up being pretty linear. In fact, it says that we've got almost zero times t squared. We've got 2.97 times x. Let's see what the linear comes up with. Instead of 2.97, they have 3.26. Now this one is probably, this graph looks pretty linear. And so if it's not perfectly linear, remember my camera may not have been perfectly level. So we'll go ahead and do that. That looks good. I'm going to close this. I'm going to, apparently there are some other trend lines on here that I don't see clearly, but that's okay. Now let's go through and let's make a second one. Insert, chart, scatter. Here's where it's going to get a little bit trickier. And if yours didn't automatically fill the information the first time, here's how we can do it, because we're going to add a data series on this. We're going to call this vertical position versus time. This time for my x values, that's the horizontal bar here, I'm going to go and I'm going to do time, because remember, it's position versus time. The second one is going to be my horizontal axis. My vertical axis. This time is actually my vertical position, which is my Y. So I'm going to go through and I'm going to select that. I just hold down left click, scroll down to the bottom, and then I've got it filled in. It says that it's using uh, cells C3 through C93. That's what it's saying there. And I click OK, click OK, scroll up, and I have myself a nice curvy line, which is good. Now there are a couple things that we can do on this. I think I need to click on the Y axis, let's go to format. If I right click, I can go to format axis. And then I'm going to go to horizontal axis crosses at axis value. It looks like the lowest that we have on here is negative 0.8. This is not something that you have to do, but it is something to keep in mind. I moved where the X axis crosses the Y so that it's not right there in the middle. I've moved it down to negative 0.8, which is the bottom of my graph. And now you can see my X axis is there. It's just a way to make it a little bit prettier. Now again, you can also put your name in the vertical position versus time. And what we're going to do now is we're going to add a trend line. We can see here the linear one is filling in where it's ridiculous. It's using blue. Let's go with black. Might be a little bit easier to see. I'm going to bump the uh, width of that line up a little bit, maybe 2.5, make it a little easier to see. Okay, now that I can see it more easily, linear 
Mm, that does not look like a linear fit at all. I can do moving average. Moving average is pretty good, but most likely what we're dealing with is a polynomial second order, just like we saw in dropping the puck. In fact, dropping the puck should be almost identical to what's going on to the ball here if we're only paying attention to the vertical part of the motion. Remember in class, we've been splitting it up where we treat the vertical motion by itself and the horizontal motion by itself as well. So I'm gonna put display equation on chart. Here it is. I'm gonna bring it up here where I can see it clearly. And we have, again, our value isn't perfect, but we suspect that the term multiplied by x squared, in this case, it's actually time squared, would be negative 6.13. Um, that should be about one half acceleration. So if I double that, I'm gonna end up with about negative 12, which is a little high. We should be in the area of negative 10. Now, sometimes that's gonna happen. Uh, it may be that we were getting kind of some weird effects with the video or something like that. I wouldn't read too much into it. The important things are we can see here with the horizontal position versus time, we have a nice straight line and in the vertical, we have a curved line. Now remember, the curved line tells me that it's accelerating, and the nice straight line tells me that it has a constant velocity, meaning it's not accelerating. This is actually showing what we've been doing on projectile motion problems, where we have the acceleration in the y direction to be the acceleration due to gravity, and y the acceleration in the x direction, we keep treating as zero, because it is. And so, this is the main thing that I'm looking for. Again, I'll go ahead and close this. Please make certain that you have your best fit actual equation here. I may not be able to see the line because hopefully it's hugging all of your data points and we've got a lot of data points this time. The one other thing that we could do on here is, let's see, design, format. I'm trying to remember where it was specifically in here. I found it in one of the other versions of Excel. Uh, page layout. You should be able to add uh, access labels on this as well. Chart tools, let's see. Add chart element. Hey, add chart element seems to have it. Access titles. Primary horizontal, so let's do that one. Oops. Strange. Access titles, primary horizontal, and we can do, I can click down here and we will do time, parentheses, seconds. Okay, now I'm going to do add axis titles, vertical. I'm going to click over here. And this one is, let's go horizontal position, and that's measured in meters. Okay, so that one's looking pretty good. And then I'll left click on this graph. That way I can do layout formulas oh design it's under chart tools design add chart element axis so we'll go to the horizontal axis time in seconds and then we're gonna go to add the other one vertical we're gonna go vertical Position. Parentheses, little m, because my units are in meters. Okay, so that should have you have you pretty well covered. These are the two graphs that I'm interested in. Um, one of the things that you can actually do is you could always go to either Word or uh, maybe PowerPoint or something like that. Because I don't need them all on their own page. That's kind of a whole lot. If I bring up an empty PowerPoint one or even a Word document would work fine. I can take this, I'm going to left click just on the graph itself, I'm gonna do control C or copy, and control V, paste. So I can put it here, and then I can go over here, control C, control V. This is fine, so you can print them both off just on one page, just make certain that it's big enough that I can actually see it and read it, or Again, you can just email me the document. But the one thing that I would stress on this, we're gonna finish this up, file, save as. And we're going to go to uh, my computer, my desktop should have, let's go desktop. I was using 
lab six is where my video is, so I will put it there. Please, please, please do not leave it as book one or give it some generic title. Give it something like maybe 2015, the year at the very least, so that way when you come back to it, you know when it's from. And you can put your name, right? And then we could do something like lab six, okay? That's very important because when you email it to me, a lot of times I will take that document and I will put it somewhere else. If your name is in the title, that is wonderful. It saves me a lot of trouble. I will also tell you this, when I went through uh, presentations in both engineering and in science, a bunch of people did not know to make unique names. So when we would upload stuff onto the professor's computer or laptop to actually do the presentation, half of the people ended up spending five minutes trying to find exactly their presentation because theirs was titled my presentation one two three or four and they were all in folders with everyone else whose uh, file was named my presentation come up with a unique naming system that works for you and feel free to put in especially with this your name into the file or even your initials by now you've noticed I have a very strange way of naming the files that I put up for you guys. But if you pay close attention, they always start off with the date, usually a description of what the thing is, or many times my initials. The things that you get from me have very unique names so that you can usually tell what they are and a lot of information about them. I really recommend that you adopt that particular approach. It will save you a lot of time and trouble. So I'm going to save this. And then I could go through and I could just attach that file to an email, email it to me, and you are set. These are the graphs that I want you to get because they get across the idea of constant velocity and changing velocity. We have acceleration in the Y. Okay, so hopefully that's helpful.